Um, now, one thing I come across in uh, London quite a lot is um, looking after clients who are purchasing leasehold properties, mm-hmm. um, apartments, which many people would think of, or flats, but ultimately the title is uh, a leasehold. Yeah. Obviously, differential is uh, you're buying a house, you own the land and the property, so it's a freehold property. You're buying an apartment, you don't own the whole building, you own just your space, and that's where you have a lease in place, typically 100 years or something plus. Um from a conveyancing point of view, what are the main challenges between freehold and leasehold? And obviously, I know the answer to this question, but which one is more challenging? Um, and what are the kind of time frames? If you looked at an average purchase that just came through to you today, one was a freehold, one was a leasehold, you know, with a bit of wind behind it, you know, which, you know, which one would complete first and what are the kind of time frames you'd be looking at? Yeah, the, uh, the leasehold, freehold things are a really big debate at the moment, isn't it? And, uh, I think Labour are really pushing to get rid of this as much as they possibly can and, and move more towards a common hold tenure. The, uh, you can't definitively say that a house is leasehold, sadly, because there are so many, uh, freehold, because there are so many leasehold houses out there. It was a really big popular. It's a very good point. Uh, yeah, there are some leasehold houses. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, some of the, some of the developers just really went for it. Um, so the more the recent new years. builds, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you can't do it now, which is great. So mm. they changed that. Yeah. If there are any brand new builds, houses, you can pretty much guarantee that's going to be freehold. Um, but if you're buying something that's 10 years old on a new development, it could be leasehold. And that's um, mm. a real problem for you because clients have often come to me and say, I didn't realize I was buying a leasehold. It's a big, big uproar with some of the big developers like the sim. And, uh, I know they, they're sort of going through the courts at the moment to try and get to a point where they can buy the freehold quickly and easily and, and cheaply as well. And it wasn't just the le- the fact it was leasehold, was it? It was the fact that there was attributed ground rents, which were yeah. then escalating and getting out of control. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, the house builders weren't doing anything wrong. They were doing everything perfectly legally. It's not a problem. I think the way the houses were sold or the conveyancing process maybe wasn't done as, as well as it should have been because when the client instructs the conveyancer to buy one of these properties, he should absolutely know it's leasehold and these are the terms and these are the conditions and all the negativity really that comes with it. Um, but I think a lot of these convincing firms were employed by the developer and that's probably one of the mm. issues. Yeah. So, so yeah, you, you, you've got freehold, leasehold and share freehold, the main three tenures. Freehold is very much you own the property and the land that's it's on within the boundary and you are responsible for all of it with a leasehold you are responsible for whatever is demised within the lease so if you are looking to purchase a top floor flat and it has access to the loft doesn't necessarily mean the loft is part of the lease the lawyer will need to look at that and tell you exactly what is part of it or if you've got a roof terrace doesn't necessarily mean your roof terrace is part of the lease um, might be unregistered. If you are ground floor flat with a garden, doesn't necessarily mean the garden's yours. So we, a lawyer will need to do a lot of extra work for a leasehold property for two main reasons. One, because the lease itself can be quite complicated. That will need to be reviewed and reported on to you and to your mortgage lender. Um, you will no doubt have lots of questions about it. I mean, leases can have lots and lots of different restrictions down to what type of flooring you're allowed or whether Mm -hmm. that's or, you know, whatever it is. The most important thing to note is obviously the financial implication of buying a leasehold property and what your renewal premium might look like if you need to renew it or what your ground rent might look like for the next however many years you plan to stay there or however many years your mortgage is more more prominently. If you've got a 30-year mortgage, you need to look at what the ground rent is going to be in 30 years. So there are lots of additional implications of buying a leasehold property. The freehold is then owned by a different party. So the freehold could be owned by an individual. It could be whole, um, owned by a company. It could be owned by um, a collection of people in the flat, but not in the, in the, in the various apartments, but not you. So, and they might have a managing company managing that freehold and that freehold um, typically extends to the exterior of the building so it could be roof balconies 
some grounds around the property, maybe access that type of thing. Loft space could be part of the freehold. So as lawyers then, and as clients, there are suddenly a lot of extra parties involved. Hmm. So you might need to, or we might need to get buildings and short certificate, for example. We can't get that from the estate agent or the vendor. We need to go to the freeholder. The freeholder might have a representative. We might need to go to them. Um, we might need to know if it's a management company, how often do they meet? What have they spent so far? What have they spent their money on? What are they planning for? Mm. Because if you're about to buy a flat and they're going to ask you for 20000 to do the balconies, you need to know what you're walking into. And this is all comes out in the conveyancing process. And then you have share a freehold. Now, share a freehold is, is, I would describe it as probably somewhere in the middle. So it's not as complicated as a leasehold, um, but a little bit more complicated than a freehold, a little bit more work for the client as well. So from a conveyancing process, it's in the middle for a client. It, it's probably just as much, if not more, but it can be more difficult owning a leasehold. So as a client, you would wear two hats. You would wear the hat of a leaseholder because you are a leaseholder, uh, but also you would wear the hat of a freeholder because you are also responsible for the freehold. So this would typically be a scenario where there are a number of units within a wider building. Let's say, I don't know, for really simple terms, it's an old Victorian semi turned into four flats. Really common. Um, those four flats probably jointly own the freehold and they will probably have a company set up to do that. So you would be buying the lease. You would then, as part of the transaction, would also acquire a share in the company that owns the freehold. Probably there's four of you, probably 25%. You'd all own an equal share. The benefit is you then get a 25% say on what happens to the building. So if you have a pot of money, you get a say on where it's spent. If you need to extend your lease, you're not going to charge yourself to do it anymore. But there's no fee for extending your lease. You just decide on ground rent. You know, all that sort of stuff, management costs. That's a positive, obviously, but it's also extra work for you as a share of freeholder. Um, so from a conveyancing point of view, when we need information about the freehold and the freehold company, we're getting it with a view of you as a client becoming a, a shareholder in that company. So it's a bit easier and there's less people you need to deal with. Obviously, when it's leasehold, you're... Um, very much disconnected from that freehold setup and how that's worked. And with a share of freehold, there, there is mm -hmm. still an underlying lease in terms of the number of years, isn't there? Correct, yeah, yeah, exactly that. But extending it is easier and cheaper. Yeah. So there's the benefit. So that that's the sort of broad landscape of it as it stood up until recent times. What's really blown us out of the water is the Building Safety Act. So this is where answering your question is really difficult. When you're buying a freehold property, we really have quite a lot of control. The mortgage lender has a bit of control, buyer and seller, but that's you know that's all we're talking about. It's a really straightforward process. When you're buying a leasehold property now, there is something called the Building Safety Act. Michael Gove brought it in in the summer of last year, year before, came into effect Valentine's Day last year, 22, sorry. Uh, the Building Safety Act is exactly as it sounds. It's there to protect buildings to a certain standard, uh, make sure they all meet a certain standard, but clearly the problem is post Grenfell and everything else, because um, it's not just Grenfell anymore, is it? There's, you know, there's lots of properties that have been subject to this. Um, and this isn't just fire safety, this is all encompassing safety. Mm. We need to do two things. We need to get all the current buildings up to a standard, and we need to make sure the new buildings that are being built are built to the correct standard. So what happens if you're buying a building that is a year old or two years old? That's not a good situation to be in. Sorry, I mean a flat. That's not a good situation to be in because the developer's starting work but might be starting it to the wrong rates. And that could be an issue from a device perspective. If you're buying a property that's 30 years old, again, a flat, and there are lots of remedial works that need to take place, there are a couple of um, 
qualification things that, that we need to consider as lawyers and make you aware of. So the broad brush uh, approach is very much if the building is above five stories or 11 meters, that is a qualifying building. But there are also other eligibility criteria because you, you also need to be buying a qualifying lease. And that lease wouldn't be qualifying necessarily if the person that owns that lease at the moment is a professional landlord owns more than three properties or it's not their main residence or they haven't owned it um, they, they haven't owned it before Feb 22, then we would need to go back to the previous owner who would have been a qualifying lease holder potentially. So there's lots of different factors that come into this. Establishing eligibility is the hardest part. Once we establish eligibility, well, what do we do then? You know, is, 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 it, we, we, we now know this, this is a qualifying lease in a qualifying building. What remedial works need to take place? And who's going to pay for it? So if the developer or the freeholder or the management company is responsible for making sure this work is done and who pays for what, you know, the chances of actually the leaseholder having no liability is probably quite small. They probably will need to make, make some sorts of payments, even if it is an eligible building and eligible lease. Um, so as lawyers, we need to advise you on all of that because you need to be going into this purchase with your eyes wide open and not be thinking, oh, it's fine, the developer's responsible for making sure that this building is safe. Actually, in reality, it doesn't work like that, sadly. They might, we might be able to put them on a hook for a certain amount of money, but it probably isn't going to cover it. Um, so we're seeing delays of about four weeks, at least probably more like eight, because we need to get all this information from all the various parties, and these parties have got certain times to respond to us by law, they're taking the full amount of time, and that is why there is just a substantial delay at the moment with the average property transaction because there's so many leaseholds being transacted. Um, and the last thing we'd want is a client walking into a situation where they're going to be liable for a lot of money just after they spent all their savings on a deposit. And I think also from a just access to a conveyancer who's able to help. I mean, I think there's a lot of conveyances who've stepped back from assisting with properties that fall under the Building Safety Act, at least they had done previously. Um, have you noticed that as well in terms of firms that have just said, look, if it's more than so many stories or it's uh, building safety, it's just not for us right now? Um, have you noticed that at all? Yeah, lots. So it comes back to insurance. So yeah. firms' insurance premiums have rocketed off the back of this. So in, if you're a firm that hasn't transacted on lots of leasehold properties before, and you go in for your PII renewal, your premiums, I've heard from, from other firms, have doubled if you want to carry on doing leasehold work and building safety work. They're asking you, out of the leasehold properties you've transacted in the last year, how many of them were over five stories or 11 meters? Well, lots of firms don't capture that information. Mm. So, so what they're saying is, well, we're, not going, we're just not going to do it. And that's fine. That's their decision. That's a business decision. I get it. Um, doesn't help the client because now the clients have got less firms. And finding a firm that can do this stuff is actually quite difficult and, and stressful for firms, uh, for, for clients. So, yeah, I, re I really feel for the industry. Um, this has not been thought through at all. I don't, I, I'm not sure how much conveyances were engaged in this before the policy was brought in, um, but it is a nightmare. And to give you an idea how bad it is, if you are buying a three story building that is seven meters, our advice needs to be similar because what if they build two stories on the roof? It's honestly, it is ridiculous. Um, but we've got to be cautious. We've got, we've got to make sure that the client understands. If the freeholder decides to build another two stories on the roof, suddenly it's an eligible building. And these are all the implications of that. So it's going to be an interesting couple of years to see this unwind. Yeah, definitely. And I guess... Going back to an earlier point we talked about around cost, I guess when it comes to a client um, sourcing a solicitor, and again, if, if again, not just to be driven by cost is something we would say, but to understand the full costs, because actually if, if the property does fall under the Building Safety Act, most solicitors, because of that additional workload, you know, understandably have to charge more. Um, and you know, along with all the other variables at times, you know, whether it is freehold or leasehold to begin with, whether it's a new build, shared ownership, whatever. Um, 
So actually, if you are buying an apartment and, and it's it may or may not fall under the Building Safety Act, something to discuss with your solicitor pretty quickly because that could fundamentally change the quote, and you know you need to budget for that, don't you? Well, this is yeah, this is the worst thing. So your agent might not let you go. Um, yeah. The conveyance uh, when you speak to them at the beginning of the transaction and say, "Can I have a quote?" They're probably not going to ask. So what I'm finding at the moment is clients have got all the way to the point of instructing a solicitor, onboarding, funding checks, ID checks, completing forms, maybe ordering searches, maybe getting searches back, and the solicitor says, oh, we're just building safety act matter, we can't act, sorry, we have to find something else. And you find it, that happens all the time. So as a client... Well, two months could have gone by by then. Yeah, quite right. So my, I think the takeaway needs to be for any client watching this is try and find out very early on if it's an eligible building or not. I mean, you'll know if it's above five stories and this is five stories above ground level, not including any roof plant stuff. Um, well, 11 metres is a bit more difficult to judge, but it's it's either, either or whatever's lower. So you can get a three-story building that's 11 metres. Um, but you you know if you're buying something seven or eight stories but this is this is building safety let your lawyer know at that point at the point of quoting i would like a quote for your conveyancing service this is a building that will be subject to building safety and then you'll you sort of know straight from the off whether they can act for you and how much they're going to charge and when we're talking about stories i mean from in the mortgage world we count them <clears throat> not the UK way, but the American way, where the ground floor is floor number one, and then you count upwards from there. Um, is that the same when we're talking about four or five stories with regards to the Building Safety Act? It is, you know, the ground floor is floor number one, and then it's one, two, three, four, five. Correct. Yeah. 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 And if there's a basement, presumably that's counted as floor number one as well, and then you count up from there? No, ground level and above. Okay. There's a difference there maybe for how some lenders view it sometimes. Lenders sometimes will count the basement as a as a floor one, even though it's underground mm, yeah and you can you can have two floors underground or three or four can't you um but right, this yeah. is this is this is five stories above ground level ground level okay which you can easily count from a google street view before you've even rocked up at the property or certainly can see when you turn up so yeah you can i i was in <laughs> i was in a meeting about this and somebody asked what if the building's on a hill where does the 11 meters start from? Well, obviously, it starts at the lowest point, but I thought it was quite funny. It's not from sea level. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh. Thank you, Chris, um, for that uh, summary. Thanks for watching. And if you have any questions, please ask below and hit subscribe below so you don't miss out on our next episode.